Spanid Peninsula, rightly famous as one of the great beauty spots in Ireland. The area is also famous, rightly or wrongly, as the centre of what was the most efficient and some would say ruthless party machine in modern Irish politics. This was the home base of the Donegal Mafia, sort of Fianna Fáil political stormtroopers who descended on by-election campaigns throughout the country for the past 10 years and transformed them into the intensive, highly organized affairs that they are today. Spanid is, of course, above all, the bailiwick of Neil T. Blaney, former boss of the party machine who now runs his own independent Fianna Fáil. For 18 months, a political scientist, an American political scientist, Dr. Pauline Sachs, took up residence here to study the party machine. Our film is based on his impressions gathered over those 18 months. As he says himself, it deals with one political machine in the northernmost corner of Ireland, but many of its themes are recognisable wherever Irishmen have taken a hand in the political game. The village of Kerry Keel on the western shores of the Fennad Peninsula is in a locality where the Irish political game has been played at its most intense. It is a few miles south of Rosnakill, the home of the Blaineys, a name synonymous with the political life of the area since the War of Independence. As a result of the partition of Ireland in 1922, Donegal was cut off by international border from its main trading center, Derry. Furthermore, it was cut off from convenient communications with the nation's capital city, Dublin. <laughs> the significance of the border is profound. Partition left Donegal with no large towns, a rural patchwork of small towns, villages and farms. Traditionally, life was rooted in the land. This tradition is changing, but it has left the countryman, despite his allegiance to the new state, very much a citizen of his village. Not only has isolation bred parochialism, but the closeness of the village community fuses family, friendship, commerce, and politics, making each a personal affair. Politics, as elsewhere in Ireland, have been dominated by the rivalry between the two parties, Fianna Foyle and Fianna Gael. Fianna Foyle, which controlled the Irish government almost continuously for 36 years, was founded by Eamon de Valera in 1926, and its roots are sunk in Republican nationalism. As the party aged, some of its grassroots organizations have matured into machines. The premier of these machines, emblematic of Fianna Foyle power at its height, was that in northeast Donegal. <laughs> Neil Blaney, who fought in the War of Independence and then on the Republican side of the Civil War which followed, is buried near Rosnakill. His tombstone, a monument to the Republican tradition of the Fanad Peninsula. The local common, or branch of Fianna Foyle, traces its genealogy directly from the first Sinn Féin common in the peninsula, which was organized in 1917 under Blaney's leadership. Secretary of the Common is John McAteer, the only Kerry Keel member of the original group still alive. Johnny is a small farmer who has lived and worked near this village all his life. Most of the men in his Common are villagers, family, close relations, and long-standing friends whose lives are bound together in many ways other than politics. Sometimes they come together socially in John's house where politics are discussed and political transactions often set in motion. I uh, oh, got to go and go back to the foundation. The first call was really a Sinn Féin club I went back in 
1917, I suppose, I remember. Just a uh, year before the 1918 election. At that particular time, we hadn't all that amount of members, but we were all pretty active. Uh, I think a thing really come into life after that election, when the election for a woman on. We put up a terrific fight there. But there was a lot of the family life and connections, like, I see, everybody nearly belonged to Neil Blinney when he went to jail, they would all become supporters. And the same thing with most of the rest of it all in the common all our connection was partly involved the same. He always said the odd one wasn't, but the most of them were. But there were those on the other side, like Harry Shields, who since the day in 1921, when he raised his hand for the treaty, remained a loyal member of the other party, Fina Gale. When a volunteer parade over in the field, I can drum. And when we got to smash me head of a meeting being held up in the old hall, I can drum. And we went up a few, but Dr. McGinley was there, and old Paddy Dawson, and Major Joe Winnie. And the end of the meeting was, uh, just in fact, they'll call us a board of flag, but said, well, show of hands, anyway, who was for or against the treaty at that time? Well, of course, there's a few of them, we all showed our hands in favor of the treaty. That'll be over 30 years. Well, I never changed my hand from that day to this day. I always felt swallowed that party. Then they will come in and yell to red and right through. Over the years since its formation, a profound change took place in the basis of Kuman membership allowing the machine to come into existence. In an intangible but nonetheless real way, the vitality of the nationalism which once animated these amateur politicians faded, and countrymen instead sought to fulfill their material ambitions in politics. The most important commodities in the commerce of politics were no longer ideologies, but goods and services. In this underdeveloped part of the country, People either left it to earn a living elsewhere, or stayed and relied on government subsidies in the form of unemployment benefit, housing grants, free medical services, and so on. The few jobs available, mainly on county council roadworks, were eagerly sought after. Ideal territory for a strong political organization to function in. In Kerry Keel, 23 out of the 35 Comen members were wholly or partially dependent on the government for their income. Well, since 1932, when the government got changed over. After that, well, unless you were a member of the Fianna Fáil party, there was no use in the trouble looking for anything else. And the, and the appointments or anything would be done, such as road work or anything at all, that well, you were just out of it, and that was that. You hadn't a chance. Or post offices, or any appointment, any collectors, any appointments at all, that was all fear the first supporter that was appointed, a whole lot. But I don't think that is really so the way it was played up to. As far as, as, far as I would remember, now, anything, anything that Neil could get done when he was in government, well, it was for the benefit of all the people of the area, and he always told them that. I don't think anybody could say that as far as he was concerned or anybody penalized. But it was not until Neil Blaney's son, Neil Terence, filled his father's seat after his death in 1948 that Fina Foyle began to develop into a real machine in Donegal. The young Neil, backed by his brothers in a tightly knit family group, was soon the county's most powerful politician. In 1957, his 35th year, he became Minister of Posts and Telegraphs in Eamon de Valera's last cabinet. Thereafter, his fortunes rose steadily as he ascended to the powerful portfolios of local government and agriculture. These elevated ranks made him not only the master of many sinecures, but also the patron of public works and programs from which his constituents benefited. During these years, Blaney came to dominate his constituency party and to shape it into a powerful adjunct to his national career. In a dubious testimonial to the power of the Blaney organization, it was dubbed by those who feared and respected it, the Donegal Mafia. When somebody refers to the Donegal Mafia, we never take it uh, uh, in a very poor spirit. We, we accept it uh, as a compliment. Um, it's 
got Naffy in the sense that it would mean in another country. Um, we like to think that we have a lot of experience in organising an election campaign and uh, most of us that are involved in politics have worked in by-elections and we look forward to campaigning in by-elections. Uh, it's a lot of experience, a lot of work and um, strangely enough we like it. Uh, I always felt uh, it was exaggerated. Uh, the Fianna Fáil organisation, in my opinion, was no different in the Donegal than it was in any other part of the country. I think the, this story really began in, uh, following the Kildare by-election in 1964, and I remember being highly amused reading newspaper accounts of the number of Donegal people who, who participated in that election. In, in fact, six from Donegal travelled to that by-election on the night before the election and worked in the town of Nace on the day of the election. On the next day, I read a report where uh, it stated that there were something like 70 Donegal people working in Kildare for three weeks. Uh, it grew from that, but to my mind, it was complete and utter exaggeration. I'd imagine that um, if there was a by-election somewhere and that workers were required in a particular by-election, that it is quite easy to get members of the organisation from Donegal uh, to come together and go there. Whereas uh, it mightn't maybe be all that easy in other uh, constituencies. And that is possibly due to the fact that we had such a good organisation in the county. Uh, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. The machine was good. Although, to be sure, it bore little resemblance to its Sicilian or American namesakes. According to the American experience, this machine should never have existed, for it could dispense little patronage, had little formal freedom from central government control, and was compelled to operate under electoral laws considered hostile to strong parties. That it survived, and in fact prospered, was due largely to its style. I ran uh, the Kerry Keel area now, the, the village in particular. Uh, Fine Gael would have always had a, a small majority, you know. But that, you know, after an election and being defeated, that majority would never be reflected. You think uh, there wasn't a vote, Fine Gael vote in the, in the village at all. And then um, the supporters in the village and right around the peninsula here having to tolerate the Blaney machine coming through, the cavalcade of cars and the shouting on the road two or three o'clock in the morning, you know. So no matter what victory you had, and the booth couldn't reflect itself or couldn't be seen in the attitude of the people you had to hide for a couple of days afterwards. No, I would say there's no justification or whatever. I don't think that there's any reason why they should have uh, felt small. It wasn't because of the Fianna Fáil party. If they did feel small, it wasn't because of them. Uh, they, they might have felt a lot of them maybe that were in Fine Gael. And I'm only speculating, I want to say that, that they might have felt that a lot of them maybe uh, took going back years to trouble times that maybe some of them maybe take, took the wrong, the wrong road at that particular time and they might have felt sort of small on themselves because of this but certainly uh, there was nothing that the Fianna Fáil party was doing or has done over the years that would m make anybody feel they were small no matter what party they belonged to because there were uh, anyone that wanted to join Fianna Fáil party certainly in this constituency I think it had obtained than most others We'll be only too glad to have them, no matter who they were. A political resource in abundant supply was family and kinship, providing a constant motif from the organization's top to its bottom. At the top were the many Blaney's, who all aided in preserving the clan's power. At each rung down the organizational ladder, a politician's family was his first and fundamental resource, both in forming an organization and as an important source of votes in the smaller arena of county council politics. Each and every one, I think, of the family were interested in politics and interested in the Fianna Fáil party from possibly at its inception and from uh, the early years of uh, each and every one of us, from the early years of our lives right along the line, uh, up until even the present day. Uh, still interested to an extent, as far as we can be. 
I think one of the things that united us uh, or gave the impression that we were very close, which indeed we are, was the fact that we uh, were a very large family. And uh, growing up, we had, well, to put it very mildly, very, very hard times. And that does tend to um, make people very close. Uh, there was none of the Blennies born with silver spoons in their mouths. Although Blaney's national position assured his local leadership, he took further steps to secure his grip over local party councils. Within the Milford area, he added over the years a host of new common, making this block contain nearly half the total number of branches, although it had less than a quarter of the constituency's voters. In turn, these local faithful ensured his control in party caucuses and conventions. But the masterpiece of party architecture was a system of bailiwicks designed to overcome the divisive effects of the electoral law. In Ireland, many members represent each constituency, and the voter casts his ballot according to a system of proportional representation by listing a series of preferences. Left to itself, and coupled with rural localism, this system might easily produce chaos. But what Fina Foyle did was to harness localism to party purposes by assigning each of its candidates a defined bailiwick. In effect, creating several single-member districts spaced evenly over the constituency surface. Local candidates are confined to their home bailiwicks, and this localism is harnessed and competition reduced. The precision with which this system is used was seen in the 1969 election. Blaney obtained a majority of the party vote to the west of the constituency, Cunningham to the east. There is little or no overlap. Both candidates made arrangements to exchange their second preference votes, maximizing the Fina Foyle vote. In between elections, these and other bailiwicks define the proper sphere of activity of each politician, so that every common head knows who his county councillor is, and each councillor which TD's area he is in. Blaney used several tiers of subordinates to assist him in running the Donegal machine. After 1957, when his ministerial duties kept him increasingly in Dublin, he relinquished his county council seat to his brother Harry, who became, in Neil's absence, his local alter ego. Aiding in the management of party business were 67 common secretaries, 10 county councillors, and Blaney's junior partner, Liam Cunningham, the TD in Inish Owen. Most party business passed through these hands, and as the organization matured, an increasing number of grassroots party activists, the village hatchet men, grew capable of dealing with clients' requests at the lowest level of party organization. On election day, these same troops marched to the fray as a tight phalanx, the very model of organization. Well, the common operated in uh, such a way as that, um, I suppose you put it down to the secretary in the first place. He would be the person who would be responsible for keeping the common really alive. And where one had a <laughs> where one had a good secretary, well, usually had a good common. And it did vary from time to time. You could say you had a good common in one area. Now and in ten years' time that could change quite a bit. But taking it all in all, I'd say that where you had a good secretary, you had a good common. Well the organization was <coughs> local and every local area would play a big part in this and as much as it they almost knew to a man exactly what her strength was in the particular area who they were and when it came to a count after an election and checking out the different boxes booths uh, we knew what was in them for each party and we could deduct from that whether we had gained a few or lost a few and almost tell who they were without ever really knowing. But you would, you would have, one would have a fair idea of who they were. 
and it was due to the, the local organisation in each area that they knew themselves they'd done a good job on the day of the election and checking out who had voted and uh, they knew beforehand who our supporters were and if this fell short the others had a fair idea who it was that didn't vote for us, that they thought was voting for us. Well, I, I think it would be very mixed now. A particular house is an area. I think, uh, Mandy, you'd know some of them better than myself, but I think this first house here, what? This Fee and the Fall. Fee and the Fall. And, uh, Next is Crossings. Would be Fan Gale. Fan Gale, that's right. Yes. And, and the next, next is Gollahers. Gollahers. Well, uh, Mr. Goller would have been for you in the fall, I think, but his wife would have been Finn Gale now, and I don't know what with it, voted after they got married, but poor Mr. Goller now he's dead, and I hope he's happy, and I don't know what the family are. I think the family is still Finn Gale. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. John Mulhern would be for you in the fall. Yes. And I'd also like to quote that that's the house where my granduncle was born, the man who wrote the very famous song, Glen Swally. That's the house he was born in. You go on up then by me and I. That's right. Isn't that right? And there's no other house on the right hand side of the... One, Barney McNamee. Or Barney McNamee. Well, well he's being the fall. And uh, then we'll cross the river Swally, where the river Swally rises. At the foot of me and to John McGinley. Jo uh, uh, John would be very... John very much be in the farm. Uh, in relation to my own as well. And then we'll come to... Uh, your own friends, Mickey McGinley. Mickey McGinley. Your, your in-laws, rather. The Van Gale. Van Gale again. Move on over then to the side of that mountain there, to Tully Honor. All my herns are fee in the fall, and um, so is Toner. Both are fee in the farm. Yes. Move and down then to the bridge. Well, that used to be... James Goller. Headquarters to feed in the fall. They used to have their common meetings there always. That's right, that was Blinney's headquarters. It was. I think maybe it still is. There are two kinds of feed in the fall. <laughs> uh, you're referring to the split. Blinney's um, feed in the fall. That's right. Our official feed in the fall, where well, there is certainly two kinds of feed in the fall, and you get a fair amount of it in this area. Well, I think maybe we gained a wee bit there. Well, we weren't as strong <laughs> I wouldn't be so ago. sure about that. Yeah. Uh, you move down then to the valley here, a little cottage in the valley, John McDade. He's Van Gale. The priest, I'm not sure. Well, the priest, <laughs> he tries to keep out of politics anyhow. <laughs> Two little houses then beside us here. And oh. They're both being the falls, McDade's and uh, McMonagall's. Oh, that's where Master Quan used to. That's right. Love. And Master Quan too. Was mm. a great IRA man, or <laughs> at one time anyway. Aye. He's dead now. Well, what would your opinion be now about the whole valley, man? You know, take from Minerai down to uh, McGinley's or Shidduk, that'll bring in the, the valley. Well, uh, it would be fairly even. I would say Fee and the Fall might have a few votes on us, but well, that'd that be, be my opinion. It would only be a few votes now. Be my opinion would have the uh, majority now. Uh, Oh, I would say they vote the way the majority, as far as I know them, for the years down, vote the way their fathers and grandfathers and all their ancestors seem to. Well, since the trouble anyway, in 1922, I think. But would you think Mandy is not changing? I've known them to change. If, well, see, a Fianna Fáil TD did something for a Fan Gael man, he might change for a year or so. Hmm. But. He'll be right back again, and the Fianna Fáil man will be the same. Uh, but I, I've got a feeling now this last number of years, back five, six, seven years, that people are changing for mm, better social services and more handy money. They might not uh, come out openly and say, I've changed my politics, I'm going to be a Fianna Fáil, I'm going to be a Fianna Gael. They were traditionally that, and they won't say what they're going to do, but I have a feeling that when they go into well, the that's... ballot box, that they vote for whatever party is going to offer the most money. For the countryman, the world of politics functions much like village society. It is structured around kinship, friendship, personal acquaintances, and commercial transactions. This is the way of things, 
And who but a fool would think otherwise? The basis for their belief in politicians is all around them. In Ireland, it is the politician's role to provide the linkage between countryman and bureaucrat. His style is a response to the particularism of the countryman. Accordingly, he, he prods, goads, and cajoles civil servants. He personalizes government for the citizens. Most countrymen seek a politician's intercession in their dealings with government, believe that they are at a disadvantage without his aid, and credit him with the responsibility for the outcome. Central to most machines is the use of patronage. What was peculiar about the Blaney organization, however, was the great scarcity of real patronage and its heavy reliance upon the imaginary variety. As far as I can see, uh, politics to the people means jobs and they look to their political leaders and their constituency to deliver the goods to them. This has been uh, the way in which they have been brought up. The people feel that uh, uh, if you want to get a job, you must get in touch with your politician. The people also feel that, that if you want to get a service, uh, for example, a medical card, you'll not get it unless you get in touch with your politician. This, of course, is a fallacy. Uh, but the people are of the opinion that you don't get things as a, a right, that you get them as a privilege. And it will take a long time to uh, change the people, to change their views. The younger people will change. The younger people see what are their rights. And they're not going to go crawling and begging the politicians for what their rights are. Um, the older people uh, have been brought up with a system of patronage and so on, which has led them to be uh, very careful, and indeed some of them are quite cynical about politics, but they feel that unless you go to the politician, you'll not get progress. Uh, being a local county councillor myself, I. Uh, uh, I'm part of the system, then, uh, but uh, I would be very foolish to stand up and say that I wanted to change the system overnight. You just couldn't change it overnight, and if you did, uh, th you would be rejected by the people at, at an election. I have, I'm part of the system. I try to uh, tell people when they come to me that uh, such things as medical cards are there as a right for them, and uh, that I will do all I can to get it for them, but if they get it, that they will be, you know, they will be getting it as uh, as their just reward. The the, the the point about medical cards and so on, of course, is, is tied up with the whole thing about home assistance officers, and the people feel very strongly about this type of thing, because if it's a if it's a, a strongly political being as a home assistance officer, then uh, automatically the suspicion of uh, granting medical care on a political basis uh, is there. Well, this has been said very often about Fianna Fáil when we were in government, and um, maybe it's true to some extent, but I think that we have been uh, left in the background by the present government because they have certainly uh, took every opportunity and they have filled every position that was uh, available. They have appointed um, all their boards um, and uh, they certainly have excluded everybody other than their own supporters. They have appointed about 4,000 peace commissioners and uh, I think that it's, it's fair criticism. I think we've accepted that it, it's done. It's done the world over and uh, I don't think it's, uh, it's very serious, it's very harmful and most of the people that are appointed are suitable and uh, they qualify otherwise for the job. People in the Fine Gael side now feel that we are in power now. Now we should do exactly what they did, um, looked after their own people. Speaking personally and for the rest of the family, I'd say uh, being associated with Needle, being a brother of his, um, as far as politics are concerned, I would say we as a family have got probably less out of it. Uh, than anybody else 
for, for a number of reasons. We didn't want anything out of it. Uh, I think we put more into it than we ever got out of it. Um, Neil, personally, Neil himself would not uh, give any of the Blaney's anything out of politics, even though they might have uh, been entitled to it. Um, they might have merited for some one reason or another, but he wouldn't uh, be seen to give them anything because he could always be labelled as giving a brother a job because he happened to be his brother and he was involved in politics. That is the sad situation into which our country has drifted. And it has drifted there because of the fact that there is little, if any, difference between any of the parties in Doyle Aaron today. And but neither family nor patronage could ensure electoral majorities. Other qualities are necessary, so sure and Neil Blaney had them, so sure will your power and charisma. And so sure will it get worse. In the spring of 1970, all Ireland suddenly seemed to stand still when he and his cabinet colleagues were removed from government, having allegedly been involved in a plot to import arms into the Republic illegally. The, the gun-running scandal sparked a crisis of national proportions. And although Blaney was later acquitted of these charges, he was stripped of party offices and expelled from the parliamentary party. Parted from Fianna Foil, but Fianna Foil has parted from us. We cannot, nor will we, join or rejoin the official Fianna Foyle party unless and until you and all the others who support the true views of Fianna Foyle are satisfied that the existing official Fianna Foyle party... The split in party ranks opened up by the scandal filtered down to the Donegal Fianna Foyle machine, which he had built up, opening ideological and personal divisions which had long festered beneath the surface. Twelve months before the Gibbons motion, uh, when the vote of confidence in the government was being discussed, the Eastern Eagle Dog Cantor met, and I pleaded with Neil Blaney then, publicly, to accept the majority decision of Fianna Fáil. I disagreed with many of the decisions that Fianna Fáil had taken myself, but I believed that the majority decision was something that we all had to take. And I told Neil Blaney then, and told him many times in the following 12 months, that I would support him as long as he supported Fianna Fáil. I think that a lot of people in Donegal were very strong supporters of Neil Blaney's and at the same time, very active and strong uh, supporters of Fianna Fáil. And it has been a very difficult decision for them to uh, decide and make up their mind whether they should be Fianna Fáil supporters, full stop, uh, and uh, Neil Blaney supporters. Up until Running as an independent, Blaney contested the 1973 elections, facing his former colleagues Cunningham and McGlinchey. Vindicating his reputation as a master campaigner, Blaney scored a strong personal success. But what was once a coordinated and centralized mechanism has now been sundered into many parts. It is at local level in the county council that the split has had the greatest effect on the machine. This council, that was once dominated and used by the Blaney organization, has now succeeded in stripping the supporters of Blaney of any responsible role in its committees. Lindsay said that about at half the amount of work that had to be done by the county manager, I'd say a lot more than half the amount of work. Surprised at the members of the opposition interrupting me, but I only hope... The members of the government, sir. Me members of the government. Uh, <laughs> Chairman, I, 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 well, I'm, I'm being interrupted, and I hope that you'll understand it. I, Chairman, I only hope that you, that you and the other members here they're entitled to, to oppose uh, my proposal, but I only hope that we will unite. The, the Blinneyites sounded members of our party, 
to see what we coalesce with them. Uh, certainly, uh, we made it quite clear that we would have nothing to do with them. Um, I think possibly principally, principally because of their approach to Northern Ireland. Basically, we had absolutely nothing in common with them. And for that reason, we, we did not coalesce with them. We coalesced with Fianna Fáil because, um, as far as we saw it, they were the lesser of two evils. Looking back over the machine's long record, one wonders who benefited from its existence. A few public works stand as monuments to Blaney's days of national power. Most notable of these is the brand new roadway up the eastern shore of Fanad, known locally as the Blaney Highway. In Letterkenny stands a new technical college, planned during Blaney's days of power. And Blaney was the author of many decisions, such as the beef cattle incentive scheme and regressive milk price increases, which benefited the poorer farmers of his and other districts, Fianna Foyle's natural constituency. Many of the people who have stood by him in his isolation, like Pat Sweeney, feel that he was responsible for the bringing of essential services to his own area that the people might yet be waiting for. If it, were, if it weren't for the politicians, uh, these things would never be done. Uh, people tend to look on them as favours, and rightly so, because uh, if you take local local issues here, uh, had it not been for Neil Blaney, we wouldn't have had a rural water supply. We were one of the first in the country. We wouldn't have had the Nokala Coast Road. We were one of the first rural areas in the country to have rural electrification thanks to Neil Blaney. We probably would have, would have had them by now, but we would have to wait much longer on them had it not been for his influence. With the exception of a few, the loyal men who worked for the machine ended little better off than where they began, at least in material terms. On average, such men moved little beyond the station in life gained by their fathers. The sort of jobs the machine handed out rate collectorships, postmen, post offices, etc., did not carry them high up the ladder of success. For the multitude of constituents, the machine's most notable achievement was the personalized service it rendered. The goading of government agencies, the aid in securing grants, the pestering of civil servants. For the ordinary countryman, the machine provided a structure of access both to local officials and to the highest reaches of government in Dublin. But despite this achievement, it seems more than possible that most government benefits would have reached Donegal even if the machine had not been there. The machine's greatest success was the perpetuation of the myth of its own necessity. Thank you.